A man walks down the concrete corridor floors of federal prison, flanked by two burly correctional officers. He is hindered by the shackles tightly clasped around his ankles, the chain making a clanging sound for each step he takes. Walking the icy cold floors in prison-issued sandals, his blood runs colder than usual. He hears the echoes of chanting. The man has been given multiple life sentences to be served consecutively. He'll never be a free man again. As the correctional officers usher him into his bare cell, the doors slam shut. The noise reverberates throughout the walls of the notorious federal institution, known for housing some of the worst killers. A place of brutal horrors, a facility of punishment for those who had failed to follow the rules that society had laid out before them. Known in the underworld for crimes that would horrify the most hardened criminals, those who knew him were petrified of him. If the devil himself was to walk the streets of Brooklyn, he'd do so in the shoes of Tommy Patera. Thomas Patera was born on the 2nd of December 1954 in Gravesend, Brooklyn, to parents Joseph and Catherine. As a child growing up, Patera was often bullied by older neighborhood children. His small size and his almost comical-like high-pitched voice made him ideal prey for the rough-and-tumble kids of Gravesend. The constant harassment would drive the young Patera into becoming a recluse at school, often coming home and crying quietly in his bedroom, unbeknownst to his parents. The bullying encouraged Patera to search for a means to defend himself, and it was this and the love of a TV show called The Green Hornet that led him to the discovery of karate. When Batera returned from Japan, he was a changed man. Now, muscly and strong, nobody dared to mess with him. The bullies who once taunted him in the streets were a distant memory. It was always Batera's dream to open up his own karate dojo, but these plans were put on hold when he began spending time in local Gravesend bars. These local bars were owned and frequented by various mob figures one of them being a feared killer in the Bonanno crime family. His name would resonate through mob history for being responsible for one of the most iconic mafia hits of the 20th century, after he and three other men shot to death the cigar-chomping Carmine Galanti, boss of the Bonanno family. His name was Anthony Indelicato, also known as Bruno Indelicato, or Wack Wack. He was a made man in the Bonanno family. He was named Wack Wack because of his reputation of being a grim reaper like executioner of individuals that were in violation of the code of the streets. Young and in his prime, Bruno took Patera under his wing and schooled him in the ways of Cosa Nostra. Bruno's days as a Bonanno superstar, however, were numbered when his father, Sonny Red Indelicato, and two other Bonanno capos were summoned to a meeting. All three were brutally murdered and their bodies swiftly buried. The hit was ordered by Bonanno boss Flip Rusty Rastelli after rising tensions between him and the Sonny Red faction of the family. The hit was carried out by the crew of a Rastelli protégé named Joe Massino. Fearing retaliation for the bloodbath, a contract was put out on Bruno and any others that opposed the Rastelli faction of the family. Fearing for their lives, Bruno and Patera fled Brooklyn and hid out in a secluded house on the edge of Long Island. A few months later, a peace deal was agreed and Bruno and Patera were permitted to return to Brooklyn. 
Patera knew if he continued to be a close ally of Bruno, his days would be numbered. Bruno's cocaine habit was now totally out of control. It was around this time that he became closely aligned with Anthony Spiro. Patera set up working for Spiro, collecting loan shark debts, and when requested, murder. Patero was known to use various disguises in order to surprise his victims, dressing up as an Orthodox Jew or even as a woman. It was the last thing the target suspected. As well as schooling Patera on the art of murder, Bruno had taught Patera the crude art of dismembering a body and making it disappear, an act which Patera would come to perfect in the years to follow. Patera proved himself to be a loyal and willing piece of manpower for the Bananos, as well as being an earner. It wasn't long after when he was rewarded by being formally inducted as a made man into the family and put under veteran tough guy Frank Lino. Frank Ganji was one of those individuals who existed on the borders of Cosa Nostra. Whether it was a combination of bad luck, bad timing, being ill-informed or abusing drugs, Frank Ganji would become one of the most important figures in the life of Tommy Patera. Ganji was a dedicated drug dealer and had been charged with a slew of crimes from burglary to murder, although later acquitted on the murder charge. He was associated with the Bonanno crime family, and he came from a culture of mafiosi. If one was to look at the appearance of Frank Ganji, mafioso would be the last word to come to mind. His appearance was more akin to that of a kitchen chef or a pizza delivery man. Ganji, along with friends Billy Bright and Arthur Governaro, started a pot business in Gravesend, Brooklyn. Things prospered for the trio initially, but problems soon arose. One day they found out that Gavinaro had been stealing. As far as they and everyone else was concerned, Arthur Gavinaro was a drug addict and a liability. After some thought, Ganji and Bright decided to eliminate him. It was a quiet night of the 27th of April 1985, as Ganji and Bright lured the unsuspecting Gavinaro to a stash house in Stillwell Avenue, Brooklyn. To lower Gavinaro's guard, the three began to freebase drugs. Once Gavinaro was relaxed enough, Ganji and Bright pulled out their guns and started firing. Unsurprisingly, their accuracy was impaired by the dopamine oozing through both their veins. They shot Gavinaro several times. However, in a last-ditched effort to save his life, he managed to make a heroic leap out of the window and onto the street and haphazardly attempted to make it to the corner. Mortally wounded, Gavinaro made it to the next block where he fell. As a police officer stood over Gavinaro, his shirt drenched from blood oozing from several holes in his body, he murmured his last words. Frank Ganji and Billy Bright did this to me. It was the end of the street urchin and dope fiend, Arthur Govinaro. Ganji and Bright were quickly arrested. Their lawyer managed to convince the jury that they were acting in self-defense, that Govinaro was trying to kill them and they were merely defending themselves. The murder charge was dropped, but the illegal possession of a firearm charge stuck and they were sentenced to a year in prison. After his release from prison, Ganji's friend Judy Haymowitz said that she knew a man that could help him. His name was Tommy Patera. When Ganji first met Patera in the Just Us bar in 1986, he was taken aback by Patera's high-pitched voice. Those who knew him were used to his voice and thought nothing of it, but Ganji was hearing it for the first time, and he couldn't help but think of Mickey Mouse. Wisely enough, Ganji didn't mention anything. If he did, he wouldn't have left the bar alive that night. Vitera knew that Ganji came from good stock, that his family members were well entrenched in Cosa Nostra, and that Ganji himself had been part of a murder. His criminal resume went down well with Patera, who was looking to expand his gang. 
Patera hooked Ganji up with a contact of his in the drugs business named Shlomo Mendelssohn, and he was soon up and running again. But in Gravesend, Brooklyn, trouble was never far away, and for the young Frank Ganji, it would be rearing its ugly head sooner than he thought. There was Vinnie Mook, Louis Bob, Frankie and Arthur. They were the four Governaro brothers. It seemed like the Arthur Governaro murder was a distant memory for Ganji and Bright, but it wasn't for Louis Bob. Bob wasn't a made guy, but he was definitely connected. His family always seemed to be connected with street violence in some way, shape or form. Vinny Mook Governaro was shot and killed in the street by Nino Gargi, Dominic Montilio and Roy DeMeo some years earlier over a long-standing dispute over an insult Mook made to Gargi's sister-in-law. When Louis Bob learned that his youngest brother Arthur had been killed, he vowed revenge on the killers Frank Gangi and Billy Bright. After the pair were released from their one-year stint behind bars, the word was out that Louis Bob had put a contract on their heads. It didn't take long for Ganji and Bright to hear about the news. Concerned about what could happen, they told Patera. Bright had done business with Patera before, so technically both of them were under his protection. Patera had been schooled well in the rules of Cosa Nostra, and he suggested that a sit-down would be their best option. He would get Ganji to ask his uncle Rosario, a captain in the Genovese family, to speak for him, and that he, Patera, would speak for Bright. This way their position would be stronger, as they would have two families speaking up for them. Anthony Spiro agreed to be the arbiter at the meeting. The sit-down was an old Sicilian tradition where disputes would be handled diplomatically before any blood was shed. It was a useful tool that would be used often in the life of Cosa Nostra, where disputes would arise on a daily basis. The sit-down was an art form. The tone of voice, hand gestures and the eyes had to be composed like a conductor carving an ensemble in front of a symphony orchestra. Any wrong move could result in the potential loss of money, loss of honor, and even worse, death itself. The sit-down took place at a quiet restaurant in Bensonhurst. All parties were in attendance. Anthony Spiro, Tommy Patera, Rosario Ganji, Frank Ganji, Billy Bright, and Louis Bob. They all walked over to a private roped off back area. It was clear that Louis Bob was seething. Even though hands were shook and the warring parties kissed, the atmosphere was tense. Lives were on the line. It was all or nothing for Ganji and Bright. Sit down or no sit down, Bob couldn't hide the feeling of blood red anger at the sight of Ganji and Bright. Although he didn't see it himself, he still had visions of his brother lying there on Stillwell Avenue, bloody and gasping for his last breath of air. Louis Bob made his case first. These guys killed my brother and I'm entitled to avenge his death, he said in a firm tone. No one spoke for a second. As the words started to sink in, Billy Bright then spoke. Your brother was stealing from us. He was an out of control drug addict that brought it on himself. Everyone knew who Arthur Governaro was and they knew he was an out of control addict. His business would be to rip off drug dealers, but as fast as the money came, it went. The next day, he'd be broke again. Governaro had been warned numerous times to smarten up his act, but the drugs had all but consumed him. It was only a matter of time before Governaro landed himself into serious trouble. Spiro listened to both sides with the look of a veteran arbiter. He knew that Ganji and Bright were earners for the Bonanno family. The pair also had made men in their corners speaking up for them. It didn't take long for Spiro to make his mind up. No one's gonna get whacked. It's the end of it, Spiro said in a firm tone. He looked at Bob straight in the eye. What's done is done. It's over. Bob knew better than to raise his voice or to have any outward display of anger. He quietly accepted Spiro's decision as bitter as it was. If Louis Bob decided to take matters into his own hands, he'd be whacked immediately. 
Justice was swift when it came to violating sit-down edicts. Viterra and Ganji's relationship was cemented. It was official. Frank Ganji officially belonged to Viterra. It wouldn't be long till he'd take the young Frank Ganji to the deepest depths of hell, to a place where Ganji's mind couldn't compute the horrors that would await him. He wouldn't know it then, but Frank Ganji was in the grips of pure evil incarnated.